anything happened, I can guarantee I'd do it again, and sooner or later I would kill another child. No, I would do it again. I've been molesting kids nonstop since I was 13 years old. How tough was it to go to the parole board two weeks ago? You looked scared to me. It was hot. I remember pulling in the driveway and seeing two cars there. What do you want to say to the family and friends of the victim of Winda here? here. What's your message to them? She knew exactly what I came for. Has executed a condemned man who killed an Akron woman back in 1997. You feel pity. Um, it's sad that, that he made the choice that he made. And uh, I'm responsible for it. As far as the death penalty, well, I didn't think about it that much. And I did not want to be incriminated in relation to her death. Wesley Allen Dodd. Wesley Allen Dodd was born in Toppenish, Washington on July 3, 1961 and had a pretty normal childhood. Dodd had initially claimed that he did not experience any hurt, even though he and his brother both had their names recorded in history as criminals who preferred to commit crimes against the young. But he later described his childhood as a traumatic one in which he experienced physical and verbal hurt from his father. Their parents' marriage was anything but stable, and it culminated in his father attempting self-hurt. Following an argument with his wife on July 3, 1976, Dodd's 15th birthday. At the age of 13, Dodd began exposing himself to children in his neighborhood, which was brushed off as the boys will be boys mentality by his father. He progressed from indecent exposure to child hurt, a trend which continued well into his naval career when he was deployed on base. In 1987, Dodd tried to lure a young boy into a vacant building, but the boy refused to go with him and instead told the police. Prosecutors were aware of Dodd's history of offenses and recommended five years in prison. Times I think about what I've done, um, I think about some of the things the boys said before they died, and, and that's real hard to think. Anything happened, I can guarantee I'd do it again, and sooner or later I would kill another child. Why do you want to be executed? Uh, I have to be. He was placed on probation and ordered to seek psychiatric treatment. After finishing probation, he stopped going to treatment and moved to Vancouver, Washington. Dodd's fantasies became increasingly violent over the years, and soon he acted on them. He lured two brothers, 11 and 10-year-old Cole and William Near, to a secluded area where they became his first victims. He went on to repeat the experience with another young boy and his last attempt to kidnap James Kirk from a local theater on November 13, 1989 became his downfall. He was taken into custody by the police, where he was drilled relentlessly for three days, finally confessing to the three slayings. During the search of Dodd's home, police discovered a homemade torture rack, along with newspaper clippings about his crimes a briefcase containing Lee, Isley's underwear, a photo album containing picture of Lee, and assorted photographs of children in newspaper and store catalog underwear advertisements. They also discovered Dodd's diary, in which he wrote in detail about the crimes. Dodd was put down at 12.05 a.m. on January 5, 1993, at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. His choice of method of demise had been hanging. Thus came an end to a life which had been useless in any positive way, rather it had been a source of pain and fear for children around him. No, I would do it again. I've been molesting kids nonstop since I was 13 years old. Uh, I will kill again. I've done it before, and at the time I liked it. How do you live with yourself daily? At times it's not easy. A few child molesters anyway are going to think twice before they do anything again. Earl Forrest. Earl Forrest was convicted of the slaying of Harriet Smith, Michael Wells, and Deputy Sheriff Christopher Parsons. The triple slaying occurred in Dent County, Missouri on February 27, 2002. Earl had a history of criminal activity, including convictions for burglary, stealing, and drug possession. According to court documents, Earl had been involved in a dispute with Harriet Smith, his ex-girlfriend, and Michael Wells, her new boyfriend. Earl had previously threatened the couple, and on the night of the slaying, he showed up at Smith's house with a gun. On that night in December 2002, Forrest, who had been drinking, went to Harriet Smith's home and demanded that she fulfill her part of the bargain to buy a lawnmower and a mobile home for Forrest, in exchange for Forrest introducing her to a source of methamphetamine. During the ensuing melee, Forrest shot a guest of Smith's, Michael Wells, in the face, slaying him. Forrest also shot Smith six times, slaying her. He took $25,000 worth of meth from Smith's home and returned to his own home where he had a shootout with law enforcement officers. He fatally shot Deputy Joanne Barnes. He also shot his girlfriend, Angela Gamblin, and Sheriff Bob Wofford, both of whom survived. When Deputy Sheriff Parsons arrived at the scene, he was also shot and slain by Earl. After a manhunt, Earl was captured and charged with three counts of slaying.
he was found guilty on all counts and sentenced fatally. The trial revealed that Earl had a long history of criminal behavior and was a known drug dealer. His defense team argued that he had a traumatic childhood, with an offensive father and an absent mother, and that he had struggled with addiction and mental health issues. However, the prosecution argued that his actions were premeditated and that he posed a danger to society. I remember pulling in the driveway and seeing two cars there. Why, why do you, why'd you sell drugs? Uh, money is really good. She knew exactly what I came for. You know, you're your own boss, and I like working for myself. She said, Earl, I'll get you a lot more. Me taking someone's life wasn't, wasn't worth this, this object. I thought she rolled her eyes like, Come out here uh, after the fourth trip to prison in California. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, whatever, you know. I started to lose it when I got drunk, and that time I, I did. How did the trouble with you and Toddy start? Uh, well, one was hers. And How'd you come to be in Missouri? He had uh, 4000 a pound. The other one was a friend of ours named Mike. Yeah, but uh, then we told her that I was serious, and... You know, what were you serious about? All I wanted was a lawnmower. So she come back, she made, you know, you make a lot of money about getting my shit. And uh, I think that pissed me off. Like I said, I stayed mad for a year and a half and was only, you know, I need some more and more, uh, you know. What, were you, what, what message were you trying to send? Earl's case went through several appeals, but his conviction and sentence were ultimately upheld. He was punished by lethal injection on May 11, 2016 at the Eastern Reception, Diagnostic and Correctional Center in Bonterre, Missouri. He spent over a decade on the row in Missouri before his punishment. Forrest was the 90th person fatally punished in Missouri since the reinstatement of the capital punishment in 1989. Rodney Reed Rodney Reed is a Texas man who was convicted of the 1996 slaying of Stacy Stites, a 19-year-old white woman who worked at a grocery store and was sentenced to the row in 1998. However, over the years, Reed has maintained his innocence, and his case has attracted widespread attention from activists and lawmakers who believe he was wrongfully convicted. Reed was born on December 22, 1967, in Bastrop, Texas. He grew up in a large family and had several siblings. Reed attended Bastrop High School, but he dropped out in the 11th grade. He later earned his GED and worked various jobs to support himself. In 1996, Stacy Stites, a white woman who was engaged to a police officer named Jimmy Fennell, was found deceased on the side of a road in Bastrop County, Texas. Stites had been strangled, and her body was partially unclothed. Her fiancé initially became a suspect, but he was later ruled out when DNA evidence was found on Stites' body that matched Reed's DNA. You feel pity. Um, it's sad that, that he made the choice that he made. And I did not want to be incriminated in relation to her death. In the last couple of days, I, I've kind of been thinking about it, but, but that was the worst mistake I've ever could have made. Well, if she's up in heaven looking down on us, I think she's probably pleased. The evidence points directly in that direction. That they do know, the state knows that I'm innocent of this case. And it has taken years, an extraordinary effort. I'm really glad that justice was served and that um, the system really does work. I feel that the truth is out there. You told the police you didn't know her. She's not coming back. That I'm innocent, absolutely innocent. To break through this bias in that community. The important love that's out there for me, I... Well, the evidence points directly at you. Try not to think about being executed. Because... That was created from the state's narrative of this whole situation. Reed, who was African-American, was arrested and charged with Stites' slaying. He maintained his innocence, claiming that he had been in a consensual, intimate relationship with Stites and that Fennel had slain her when he found out about it. However, the jury found Reed guilty and he was sentenced to his demise in 1998. In 2019, Reed's case gained national attention when celebrities such as Rihanna began advocating for his release. In November 2019, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals granted Reed an indefinite stay from his punishment, citing the need to consider new evidence and testimony in the case. Wanda Jean Allen Wanda Jean Allen was born on August 17, 1959, the second of eight children. Her mother was an alcoholic. Her father left home after Wanda's last sibling was born and the family lived in public housing and scraped by on public assistance. At the age of 12, Allen was hit by a truck and knocked unconscious, and at 14 or 15, she was knived in the left temple. It was found that Allen's intellectual abilities were markedly impaired and that her IQ was 69. Found particularly significant 
was that the left hemisphere of her brain was dysfunctional, impairing her comprehension, her ability to logically express herself, and her ability to analyze cause and effect relationships. It was also concluded that Alan was more chronically vulnerable than others to becoming disorganized by everyday stresses, and thus more vulnerable to a loss of control under stress. How tough was it to go to the parole board two weeks ago? You looked scared to me. It was hard. But, you know, the reason, you know, Jean likes for us to be present during these times of interview, remind her of things that um, she would like to say, and that's all about the brain damage, right. you know, and, and the borderline uh, mental retardation that she had. In our lives to happen so it can break us of ourselves and we be blessings to other people as well. Uh, it was more harder for me to see the people that love me go through what I was going through. I think about every day I have a birthday that the victim's daughter should be here with them today. By age 17, she had dropped out of high school, which was only the beginning of a dark journey. In 1981, Alan was sharing an apartment with Deidre Pettis, a childhood friend turned girlfriend. On June 28, 1981, they got into an argument and Alan shot and slayed Pettis. In her 1981 confession, Alan stated that she accidentally shot Pettis from roughly 30 feet away. However, a police expert testified that bruises and powder burns on Pettis' body indicated that Allen had pistol whipped her, then shot her at point-blank range. Nevertheless, prosecutors cut a deal with Allen and she received a four-year sentence. Another seven years passed before her second and last brush with the law occurred. Allen was living with her girlfriend, Gloria Jean Leathers. The two had met in prison and had a turbulent and violent relationship. On December 2, 1988, Leathers, 29, was shot in front of the Village Police Department in Oklahoma City following a violent catfight breaking out between the two women at their own home. Leathers passed away from the injury three days later on December 5, 1988. Leathers' mother had been a witness to the incident and the revolver involved in the shooting was recovered. Allen spent 12 years on the row. Her application for clemency was denied. While in prison, she experienced a spiritual awakening before she was put down by lethal injection by the state of Oklahoma on Thursday, January 11, 2001, at Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister. And it was like, after then, I can't remember all that happened. It was like I was there physically, but not mentally. What I'm saying is, at the time when I went to trial, they wouldn't allow me and my attorney at the time, Bob Carpenter, and they kept continuously telling the jury, this person was timid and meek and never done anything in her life. And this is where I need to be, I'm where I need to be. Out there, I didn't have the money. But you were carrying the gun. I didn't have the gun on me. Brett Hartman. In November of 2012, Ohio fatally punished a condemned assassin, Brett Harmon, who went to his demise still claiming he was innocent of knifing a woman 138 times, slitting her throat and cutting off her hand. I'm good, let's roll, Hartman said with his last words. He then smiled in the direction of his sister and repeatedly gave her, a friend, and his attorney a thumbs up with his left hand. Hartman was given a single dose of pentobarbital and the warden declared his time of demise as 10.34 a.m. Hartman was the 49th inmate put down since Ohio resumed these kinds of punishments in 1999. Hartman acknowledged that he had relations with Winda Snipes early on the morning of September 9, 1997 at her Akron apartment. He also says he went back to Snipes' apartment later that day found her mutilated body and panicked, trying to clean up the mess before calling 911. But Hartman said he didn't slay her, a claim rejected by numerous courts over the years. Hartman's attorneys long said that crucial evidence from the crime scene and Snipes' body had never been tested, raising questions about Hartman's innocence. But ask why, why are they hiding, why are they lying so? When it comes to hands, they searched everywhere. Up until my trial, no one in the world deserves to lose a relative or anyone and every single time it's come back proving the person's innocent. He is the 49th inmate put to death since Ohio resumed executions 13 years ago. The way that uh, windows, you know, was taken, it's the hair, the hair, fingerprints, and, you know, I've never been to prison before, so I'd have no idea. Slitting her throat and cutting off her hands. And yet they take only the watch and that mysteriously ends up being the one thing that was windows. Why are they refusing to test DNA? But has always denied he killed her. Especially family is a very uh, traumatizing experience. Hartman admitted he had sex with Snipes the day she died. Critical pieces of evidence. But, you know, I didn't do it. You know why, you know their excuse for why they didn't lift those prints?
The evidence included fingerprints allegedly found on a clock and a mop handle. Hartman also argued that evidence could implicate an alternate suspect. The state opposed those arguments, citing the strength of the evidence and the fact that courts have repeatedly upheld Hartman's conviction and fatal sentence. The state also said Hartman refused to take responsibility and show remorse. Tommy Ziegler Tommy Ziegler was convicted of slaying his wife, her parents, and a customer at the Winter Garden Florida furniture store that he owned. Born on January 24, 1940 in Georgia, Ziegler was raised in a deeply religious family, attending the Baptist church regularly. He graduated from high school in 1958 and went on to serve in the Army, where he was trained as a paratrooper. After completing his military service, Ziegler attended college and then began working for his family's furniture business. In 1970, he and his wife, Eunice, bought a furniture store in Winter Garden, Florida. The couple was well known in the community and were seen as successful business owners. However, on December 24, 1975, Ziegler called the police to report that his family had been attacked and that he had been shot. When police arrived at the scene, they found the bodies of Ziegler's wife and her parents, as well as a customer who had been in the store at the time of the attack. Ziegler was the only survivor. Despite his claims of innocence, Ziegler was convicted of the slayings and sentenced to his demise in 1976. His case had been the subject of much controversy over the years, with many people believing that he was wrongfully convicted. One of the key pieces of evidence used against Ziegler was the slaying weapon, a 38 revolver. The gun was found in Ziegler's car and his fingerprints were found on it. However, Ziegler's defense team argued that he could not have used the gun to commit the slayings because he had been shot in the stomach during the attack and could not have wielded the gun for any accuracy. Another point of contention was the testimony of Ziegler's neighbor, who claimed to have seen a man matching Ziegler's description leaving the scene of the crime around the time of the slayings. However, the neighbor had initially described the man as being much shorter than Ziegler, and some witnesses claimed to have seen Ziegler at the store at the time of the slayings. They got a, they got a conviction, and here I am stuck. In my life, the way, the way I was, was raised and, and with the life I had, what we had, what we did, what we could have had, what we could have done. I believe it's appropriate to uh, request the court to... I didn't do it. Look at the evidence that we present. To bring in whatever new evidence we also forgot. And the prosecution hid so many key elements from the defense. You're 73. And I feel every day of it. Uh, I didn't pay too much attention. And the, and, and the death penalty is political, very political. No domestic problems of any yes. kind. No infidelity, no. no stress. No. To authorize release of additional pieces of evidence. That's not reasonable. That the jury was not able to hear. And I'm positive. But to leave this order open-ended for a year? How long have you been on death row? 46 years. How could I stop? The guy is innocent. There's not a day go by that I don't think about her. All the evidence pointed to Tommy Ziegler. As far as the death penalty, well, I didn't think about it that much. He will die on death row one way or the other. Now, I can tell you straight up it's wrong. Marriage was good. Very good. Now, nearly 47 years after being convicted of the quadruple slaying, Ziegler has finally been permitted to independently conduct new DNA testing on evidence he claims will prove his innocence. Circuit Court Judge Patricia L. Strobridge approved Ziegler's request for DNA testing in October 2022. As soon as her ruling was finalized, more than 100 pieces of previously untested evidence were shipped to a California lab to be tested at Ziegler's own expense. This is the culmination of a long legal process for Ziegler, who made his first DNA testing request in 1994. In 2001, DNA testing on portions of Ziegler's clothing found no trace of the victim's blood. Following those results, Ziegler's lawyers requested access to more evidence and permission to conduct further tests at their own cost in 2003, but their requests were denied. This could be the one thing that saves Ziegler's life. Edward Wayne Edwards The story of how Edward Wayne Edwards was caught as a prolific serial slayer is one of the most revering ones out there. It all started in Watertown, Wisconsin. Timothy Heck and his girlfriend Kelly Drew were attending a wedding reception on August 9, 1980 at the Concord House, a local venue. The 19-year-old high school sweethearts were looking toward the future. He wanted to be a farmer, she just finished beauty school. They had plans to meet friends after the party, but the couple vanished without a trace. After 48 hours, the Jefferson County Police Department launched a missing persons investigation for the couple. 
Area police forces joined in the search for Hack and Drew, whose clothing was found a few miles from the Concord House. The situation turned from a missing persons case to something more sinister. Police questioned Concord House employees, including handyman Edward Wayne Edwards, who said he had no information. Weeks after the articles of clothing were found, two decomposing bodies were discovered in a wooded area that was later identified as Hack and Drew. No weapon was found at the scene, but the crime appeared to be a knifing. Ligature marks also indicated strangulation. The presence of intimate liquids on Drew's clothing also led to suspicion of a physical exploitation. The crime became known as the Sweetheart Slayings. Despite an extensive police investigation, detectives eventually run out of leads. At the time, John Edwards, Edwards' son, was just nine years old. He recalled the search parties and helicopters. He also said he remembered that just after the discovery, his father hurriedly moved the family, including his four siblings, out of the area. In 2008, Richard Lewell, now retired as a special investigator with the Wisconsin Department of Justice, asked that the nearly 30-year-old Sweetheart Slaying's case be reopened. Lewell approached the case with vigor and a hunch. He believed that the odds were strong that police had actually interviewed the Slayer and that name would be on file. After two months of digging into the files, the name that stood out to him was Edward Wayne Edwards, who fled the area with his family after the slayings. Investigators questioned witnesses about the handyman. They told him that he was short-tempered and volatile, a man who'd beat up his kids and wife and was basically a monster. Lewell also learned that Edward Wayne Edwards, who was born in 1933, was raised in an orphanage and spent time in juvenile detention. More criminal activities followed, including an armed bank robbery in the 1960s in Akron. Arrested in 1962 for the robbery, he spent five years behind bars. When he got out, he married and started a family. He claimed he turned his back on crime and wrote a book about it, but it was all a front. His father's pattern of getting jobs, piling up debt, and then fleeing to another area took hold. Boy lived with some foster parents on the other side of town in Burton. Oh. I, I deserve it, yes. With Danny, I saw an opportunity to, for the insurance purposes and everything. I'm, I'm sorry and everything, but uh, I'm not going to stand up and beat myself on the chest, and certainly I'm... And so he ended up going with, living with one of the kids that he used to be there. He was not a foster son, he was not an adopted son. I'm not going to get up in court and apologize and things like this. It's already... Ended up getting $250,000 out of it, and uh, he got, the, the, the people there got divorced. I believe that would be an insult to injury. That, that we had his name changed to Danny Boy Edwards and that, but he went about a year to set it up, and that's what I did. I set it up to collect the money. And Lewell's team knew they had one surefire way to connect Edward Wayne Edwards to the sweetheart slayings, the DNA sample left on Drew's clothes. They eventually tracked him and his wife to a trailer park in Louisville, Kentucky. By that time, he was 74 years old, obese, and relying on oxygen to breathe. He grudgingly agreed to have an oral swab to collect a DNA sample. At a crime lab in Wisconsin, Edward Wayne Edwards' DNA and the genetic material at the crime scene matched. On July 30, 2009, he was arrested and brought to Wisconsin. Edward Wayne Edwards seized control of the situation. He didn't want to spend his life in prison and would have rather had capital punishment. He sent a letter to the Ohio prosecutor's office. In it, according to Brooke Ellen Tuber, assistant district attorney, Jefferson County, Wisconsin, Edwards made a provocative statement. He wrote that once officials knew what he had to share, you're going to want to put a needle in my arm. Edwards confessed to slaying 21-year-old William Billy Lavico and 19-year-old Judith Straub in Park Norton, Ohio. But he hadn't played his last hand yet. Edward Wayne Edwards then confessed to slaying his 23-year-old foster son, Danny Boy Edwards, in 1996 with a shotgun. The motive? Getting the payout of the young man's life insurance worth $250,000. On March 8, 2011, Edward Wayne Edwards was sentenced to his demise for the slaying of Danny Boy Edwards, finally getting his wish, Robert Fratta. They say that Robert Fratta was a deviant who was motivated by a messy divorce, a bitter custody battle, and money from an insurance policy. These things drove Robert to pay an 18-year-old trigger man $1,000 to slay Farrah Fratta, the mother of his three children, in 1994. Fratta organized the slaying for hire plot in which a middleman, Joseph Pristash, hired the shooter, Howard Guidry. Not being afraid to die, I think that's more of my relationship with God. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Yeah, I don't mind dying at all. 
She didn't meet the physical attributes of, of what I was looking for in, in a wife. He showed no remorse. He showed only the fact that he was full of himself, that he was cocky, that he could beat this. You learn to control your emotions. During the interview, that, that uh, he was not what we'd call freely forthcoming with all his information. Farrah Frada was shot twice in the head by Guidry in her home's garage in the Houston suburb of Atascosita. Robert Frata, who was a public safety officer for Missouri City at that time, had long claimed he was innocent. But justice caught up with him when his guns for hire decided to become witnesses at his trial. Frata was first sentenced to the gallows in 1996, along with his accomplices, but his conviction was overturned by a federal judge, who ruled that confessions from his co-conspirators shouldn't have been admitted into evidence. He was retried and resentenced to demise in 2009. During a 2009 retrial, the couple's children, who were then young adults, testified against their father, and Frada was convicted and sentenced to her end once more. After 26 years on the row, a judge finally scheduled his date of demise. The former Missouri City police officer was finally put down, making him the first person in the state of Texas to be done so in 2023. Bob thought he was smarter than everybody else, and he thought he was smarter than we were. Uh, one thing he didn't count on, though, is that there were phone records. He pulled the gun, gun up, and I shot him once in the head, and she, like, fell to the side. If he has any compunction towards guilt for killing someone, then they can exonerate themselves by having someone else do the killing. They shouldn't feel guilty. They actually did not murder the person. Carl Wayne Bunchen. Texas' oldest Enro inmate was punished in April of 2022 for slaying a Houston police officer during a traffic stop more than years ago. Carl Bunchen was born on March 30, 1944. When he was a child, his father slew a man in front of one of his sons and was violent towards his whole family. In one incident, he smashed his wife's teeth. Bunchen sustained broken bones from the harm, and he said he had post-traumatic stress disorder because of it. One of his brothers served a 20-year sentence for an unrelated crime. Bunchen had a lengthy criminal history prior to the slaying, starting with a theft conviction in 1961. Over the years, he gathered convictions for burglary, damage to property, and possession of narcotic drugs. At the time of the shooting, Bunchen had been on parole after serving 13 months of a 15-year sentence for physically exploiting a child. On April 10, 1971, his twin brother, Kenneth Bunchen, was slain by two police officers during a shootout. At the time, Bunchen had supposedly vowed to avenge his brother's demise. In addition, he had allegedly told a companion that he would rather shoot it out with police than be sent back to prison. On June 27, 1990, Bunchen was the passenger in a vehicle that was pulled over by 37-year-old Houston Police Department officer James Irby. Irby began speaking with the driver, and Bunchen exited the vehicle and shot Irby once in the head. Irby fell to the ground, and Bunchen shot Irby twice in the back. Bunchen fled the scene, shooting at others who were nearby. After slaying Irby, Bunchen also attempted to shoot at a driver during a carjacking attempt, fired at another officer, and held another person at gunpoint before he was arrested. Bunchen was apprehended in a nearby building. In 1991, a jury found Bunchen guilty of capital slaying, and he was sentenced to his demise on January 24, 1991. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals vacated Bunchen's sentence in 2009. Bunchen went to trial again in 2012. At the trial, his brother testified about their childhood. On March 6, 2012, Bunchen was again sentenced fatally by a jury. On March 30, 2022, Bunchen's lawyers asked the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles to commute Bunchen's sentence to a lesser sentence or to give him a 90-day reprieve. They argued that Bunchen's sentence should be commuted because it was imposed by a jury that wrongly predicted he would pose a future danger to fellow inmates. They also stated that Bunchen's physical impairments, including sciatic nerve pain that sometimes required him to use a wheelchair, would prevent him from harming anyone should he be released. Additionally, the lawyers asked for a 90-day reprieve to determine if Bunchen would have access to his spiritual advisor during the punishment based on the previous Supreme Court decision in Ramirez v. Collier. On April 19, 2022, the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles rejected Bunchen's request for commutation or clemency voting unanimously against Bunchen. One week prior to Bunchen's scheduled punishment, he contracted pneumonia, which makes lethal injection more painful. On his return from the hospital, where he received treatment for pneumonia, Bunchen received a head injury when the vehicle he was being transported in came to a sudden stop. In an interview shortly before his punishment, Bunchen expressed remorse, saying, Every day for the last 32 years, I have regretted what happened. As is customary, he was given a $20 budget for a special meal the night before being punished. 
The elderly triple slayer chose a double bacon cheeseburger, a deep dish apple pie, and vanilla bean ice cream. How often do you think about that day? I think about it every day. I can only say that it was an amazing feeling. A lethal dose of pentobarbital was administered. Every day for the last 32 years, I have regretted what happened. When you're sorry that something happened, is that, is that, the, is that the right word, remorse? I, th I think the answer is yes. Thank God after 32 years. And stood over my husband's lifeless body and shot him twice more in the back. I wish it hadn't have happened. Some sense of closure and moving forward. He thanked his friends. He addressed the Irby family. Because he was fixing to kill me. I was with him up to about 15, 20 minutes before his death. Deepest breath I've been able to in the last 32 years. Carl Bunchen was executed tonight for the 1990 murder. <coughs> Is that called remorse? Why did you shoot Officer Irby? The only thing Jim ever said to the guy was he told him to get back in the car. Of Houston Police Officer James Irby. When I pulled my gun, it was in self-defense and he expressed remorse for those actions. Bunchen did make a last statement, acknowledging that he was the killer of their father and of her husband. In his last moments, when he was being strapped to the gurney, he said, I wanted the Irby family to know one thing. I do have remorse for what I did. I pray to God that they get the closure for my slaying their father and Mrs. Irby's husband. I hope to see you in heaven someday, and when you show up, I will give you a big hug. Bunchen, joined by his spiritual advisor, began praying Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, as the lethal dose of the powerful sedative pentobarbital began. He took a deep breath, coughed once, then took three less pronounced breaths before all movement stopped. He was pronounced deceased at 6.39 p.m., 13 minutes later. Several dozen motorcyclists, including motorcycle officers from the Houston Police Department and retired officers from motorcycle clubs, gathered outside the Huntsville unit and revved their engines at the time of the punishment. Those attending the punishment stated they could hear the noise, with some calling it disrespectful and disgusting. James Barnes Born on April 27, 1944 in Detroit, Michigan, he was regularly mistreated by his alcoholic parents, with Barnes claiming that his mother had attempted to miscarry by ingesting a quantity of drugs. In another instance, he had been put in a sack and lowered into a well as punishment for misbehaving. He started exhibiting signs of mental illness early in his life, and had to be treated in various institutions around Michigan, Tennessee, and Missouri for depression, hallucinations, and drug use. In between these treatments, Barnes committed a variety of petty crimes, with his most notable conviction being for a bank robbery committed in Detroit. After being released from prison, Barnes found employment as a factory worker for a General Motors plant, but was laid off after company sales went down. Left without a home or any close living relatives, he decided to move to Memphis, Tennessee, setting in the Nightwoods neighborhood of Parkway Village. From August to November 1988, Barnes would attack at least five prostitutes, three women and two male transvestites, around various neighborhoods in Memphis. Three of these resulted in fatalities. The last confirmed attack occurred on November 5, when Barnes picked up 30-year-old Eric Lewis from 4th and Vance Avenue. It's just there's different um, personalities. Yeah, and for you. For me, huh, for... For me, uh, I appreciate it. You have observed that? I have observed that. You know, I've been, in December, I've been locked up for 13 years. Well, it was for a previous uh, conviction Correct. on murder charges. Correct. Yeah. He then drove to the rear of 674 South Main, where he shot him with his pistol. Like Thompson before him, Lewis's injuries proved non-fatal, and he survived the attack. Following the slaying of Thomas, the Memphis Police Department formed a special task force to investigate the recent slayings, which predominantly focused on interviewing various people for potential incriminating information. A major break came right after the attack on Lewis when a witness claimed that they had marked down the license plate of the car that had picked up Lewis. When examined, it was revealed to be a gray Hyundai belonging to Barnes that matched the description of the supposed offender's car, seen in some of the other attacks. Several officers were then tasked with keeping watch of Barnes and on November 10, he was arrested after a short car chase. The arresting officers saw him throw out a pistol during the chase, and when ballistic tests were performed on it, it was established that it was the same 32 pistol used in all five attacks. They finally had him, and all that was left were the court proceedings before this criminal got his just desserts. Simple, right? Not so fast. 
What stood between James Barnes and Destiny was an ocean of psychiatric evaluations, which concluded that Barnes did indeed suffer from mental disease, claiming that the psychiatrist had identified 12 distinct personalities with separate body language, mannerisms, and facial expressions. Barnes was detained in various mental health institutions until 1996, when it was finally ruled that even though he was indeed mentally ill, he understood the nature of his crimes and was thus eligible to stand trial. With his trial scheduled for September 1997, Barnes unexpectedly made guilty pleas on all three counts. As part of a plea deal with prosecutors, the penalty sentence was dropped and the charges were reduced to second degree. Instead, he was sentenced to 40 years imprisonment with a chance of parole after serving 16 years. Barnes was then transferred to the Lois M. DeBerry Special Needs Facility in Nashville, where he would remain under treatment until he served out his sentence. And basically, what he, is the sleeper hold? Uh, where he took her neck and put it in the crook of his arm, and actually what ends up happening is he chokes her to death, he strangles her to death. That's all we have for you folks. Join us next time.